I'm uh, pleased to call to order the May 15th meeting of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission. Uh, we will start, as always, by asking for approval of the minutes of our prior, meter, prior, prior meeting, the May 8th meeting. Um, does anybody have a motion to that effect? Uh, I do, Mr. Chairman. I move that we accept the uh, minutes of the May 8th meeting. They've been posted uh, on our website and uh, have been distributed to all commissioners. Second. Any questions, any corrections, any suggestions about the uh, minutes? All in favor of adopting as submitted, say aye. 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 All opposed? The motion is passed. Um, item number three, administration. Um, Commissioner Z Zaniga, you want to give us an update on the um, executive director search, and also we wanted to talk about the draft um, statement, position statement that was put together by the prospective gaming consultants. Sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, as, as you know, we issued an RFR that was, uh, which deadline uh, was last Friday. Um, we received two responses. And at this point, we are conducting what's called a phase one review. Um, essentially a compliance of the forms, all the forms uh, that are required as part of the submission. That, um, that evaluation is done by staff, that review, if you will, is uh, being done by staff as we speak, not the person or persons who is going to be evaluating the responses. So um, the, the purpose of that, um, among other things, is should there be any uh, minor cures that are needed, a form that was not submitted or submitted without the proper signature or et cetera, that this period would allow um, those respondents, if there is such a thing, to, um, to cure that. So um, we're, we're really just, um, Brandon is going to help with the evaluation of that phase one. And that's, that's where we stand at And then this after point. that, you'll look into the substance of the... Yes. The after after phase one review is concludes, then we, we proceed into the evaluation of, um, of, the, of the responses. Great. Okay, great. Um, we ask uh, the gaming consultant, even in advance of technically going to work for us, to put together a draft position statement um, position description for the executive director in order that when we get a search firm, they'll have a sort of a head start. Uh, and um, I think you all have a copy of that. Any what issues? First of all, to be clear, this is not the position description for the executive director. This is a draft which has come from our gaming consultant with what they think needs to be included in that. And we will give this to the search firm and work with the search firm to turn it into a final draft. So. Just to be clear on that, any any important substantive issues? Yeah. Yeah, I have um, by way of comment and you know for discussion, um, there is item E um, under the supervision of the commission says here some of the general duties and responsibilities would include appoints and employees with the concurrence of the commission um, general certain officers and staff as necessary. I, so, um, I would like to see some of this language changed to make clear that it is the commission that appoints uh, officers um, and staff, not with concurrence, but this subject to the approval of the commission. What's, the, what's, the, the, what's the legislation, well, uh, the legislation speaks to um, the executive director having the ability to appoint a chief financial officer, but he's silent about anybody else. Um, and even the chief financial officer is with the, the approval of that's the right. commission. Right. And even with the, right. right. So I just want to clarify that um, an executive director will, um, will not have their own discretion in appointing um, only with a concurrence. I want to enforce, um, uh, make it more clear that it is uh, that 
that the discretion is of the commission, that, uh, that the approval is of the commission, the appointment comes from the commission. But we would want the executive director to do all the legwork. Absolutely. Do the right. basic hiring, yes. I mean the basic uh, recruiting and re interviewing and so forth, and then make a recommendation to us with us having the ultimate authority. The ultimate authority, to say yes right. or no. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, Another point that I would make, which um, you know is, is, is silent here, but it's clearly in the legislation, um, the executive director uh, shall serve at the pleasure of the commission, and uh, of course reports to the commission, um, and um, you know which I, I would just like to see incorporated in this job description. Um, okay. and, and, yeah, yeah the, the only, we'll work on this when we get the search firm going, um, but. I, even as I read this, I would increase, I think, the emphasis on gaming, gaming regulatory management experience. You know, this, I think we all feel really, really urgently that we need a senior strong person who has been a top person or a next to top person in a similar kind of a regulatory agency. And that's clearly here, but if, if I were doing this, I would upgrade that even a little more. Okay, so we'll just keep this in the file for the for the um, agency when, when, the, when the search firm when we get one. Anything else on 3A executive director status? Um, other hiring needs. Uh, there are two processes going on, as you know. One is the there's a, uh, uh, a, a what do you call it? A posting a job posting went out for four jobs, basically at this sort of organizational administrative admin level. We got many, many over 600 applicants. They've been winnowed down, and we're getting close to identifying top prospects. So we can pull, we'll have a pool that as we need more people, we can pull from this pool. And there's already been one request from Commissioner Cameron and Commissioner uh, Stebbins that they would like an admin, an executive assistant, and that should be in the pipeline very quickly, right? Um, all. Uh, as all of our hires subject to background checks um, before they are announced. Um, also, we are, Commissioner Zuniga and I are talking to people who are people who might give us more senior administrative support in that would replace the acting ED. We're probably not going to go back to an acting ED, but we do need some kind of senior support. And we have. Uh, interviews set up with I think three and possibly four people and he and I will um, he and I will see if we can make some recommendations you know one of the things that's complicated here is is figuring out exactly what each of these people will be doing we know there's a need but it's everything is a little inchoate at this po point and without a specific you know we're not really looking for a CEO we're not looking for an ED and we're not looking for somebody to hire all these other people so defining the job is not simple but the, the Commissioner Zindi and I thought we would work on that but if anybody can articulate thoughts either now or or uh, later on to us as to how you would see the the lines of responsibility and accountability for this interim period go um, that would be helpful to to us who are trying to get our arms around people. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, it seems to me that, that the um, discussion uh, we're uh, in the process of having uh, with respect to the uh, overall work plan for the gaming consultant, at least the near-term uh, task that they have outlined, will help us uh, by um, defining tasks that need to be done yeah. in the near term, uh, the yeah. qualities and capabilities that we need for the people to drive it. So. I think that, that the definition will be of the person we need will become more clear as we get into the nitty-gritty of who, what, what tasks we need to accomplish uh, immediately. I mean, we all have certain visions of what those tasks are, but yeah. as we plan them and organize them as we, as we are in the process of doing, uh, these qualities will emerge. Yeah, that's a good point. And as we, as we talk through the, work, the draft work plan, we'll, I think that we'll begin to see that in some of the ideas we've talked about building an overall right. project management chart. Right. Okay, that's great. That's a good point. Um, okay, outside, anything else, else on other hiring needs? Um, 3C, outside council status? Uh, we have signed uh, with uh, our outside council, Anderson and Krieger, the contract today. Uh, they've uh, 
had an uh, initial work plan in place. That work plan will be integrated with the work plan of the gaming consultant so that the two can proceed uh, in tandem. Um, and they have um, uh, done a very thorough analysis of the uh, statute and the uh, various components of the statute uh, to date and have also uh, provided the um, legal support that's necessary to make the transition uh, from the um, Racing Commission's responsibilities to us. And uh, so they've accomplished that work and are now prepared to turn to the task of integrating their efforts with those of the gaming consultant to take the next step to stand up the commission. So we're, we're moving in, in, in the right direction with that. Are they here? And, yeah. Yes, Bill Leahy yeah. uh, here is uh, one of the partners with Anderson and Krieger. And, he has been uh, dealing uh, primarily with the racing uh, piece of it, although he is uh, working closely with Stephen Anderson, the other partner in charge, who has been working on the regulatory pieces. Um, and together they are supervising a tasked group at uh, Anderson and Krieger that's providing the services that we need. And did, did you, so we've, we've signed the, uh, the mm -hmm. contract? The, well, the contract has been signed Okay, today. so it's ready yeah. to go. Okay. So great. Good, and we authorized that last week. Right? We did. Um, I will just say Anderson and Krieger have jumped right in here with a, with a will and uh, and talent, and it's been really helpful to us uh, on a lot of issues really quickly. So thank you very much for that. And again, when we get to the work plan discussion, I think other commissioners will understand better what Commissioner McHugh was talking about, about integrating these various work plans. Um, I do have a question, Commissioner, or perhaps for Council. Um, the there, we have this gaming policy advisory committee, which the um, is meant to be set up, and there are a number of sub subcommittees on mitigation, on various things, compulsive gambling. The membership of that committee includes people who represent the the licensees, and in some cases, the host communities and the surrounding uh, host communities and surrounding communities, which suggests that we're not supposed to set that up until after the licensees are identified. Although there are some functions that are, are implied, particularly in some, some of the subcommittees, like mitigation, for example, that could precede that. So does any, does, do you have an opinion on when we're supposed to do that? Uh, from reading the statute, uh, Mr. Chairman, it seems to me that that's to be done after uh, uh, a license is awarded and has an ongoing supervisory, or not supervisory, an ongoing advisory role. There is, however, no reason why, uh, through issuance of regulations, we can't consider another uh, approach to get earlier uh, at least a partial committee on board to give advice as the process is going forward. Uh, that's certainly something we can look into and certainly something that uh, can be part of the regulatory examination as we're in the process of setting up the, standing up the committee, uh, the commission. Okay. Uh, but but it seemed to me, and looking at the statutory language, that that was designed to be a body that would continue Ongoing. to monitor right. okay. operations and give us advice and feedback as to how things were going. Okay. Good. Well, that's good from the standpoint of we've got plenty to do. But I but I do think it's somewhere along the line it probably wouldn't be a bad idea. We're doing it informally with our mitigation right. forum and our compulsive gambling forum right. and so on and so forth. But it wouldn't be a bad idea to probably to consider seriously structuring an antecedent of that, um, those groups, sooner than later. But we'll talk about that in the next yeah. few weeks. But great, thank you. That's a help. That's helpful. Um, anything else on any of the admin topics, council? Well, just one thing that I would agree with the, the notion uh, about the advisory panel or advisory uh, board, because its nature is advisory. Um, the sooner that we can have something, uh, whether that's a version of the final board or or a subset, um, would be very very beneficial for this commission in terms of policy yeah, I think uh, so considerations. Too. I think so too. Okay, good point. Um, item number four, big item. Um, Commissioner Cameron, I'm going to pass this over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as you know. We are mandated by law to transition all responsibilities formerly held by the State Racing Commission to the Massachusetts Gaming Commission on May 20th, 19, uh, 2012, uh, the end of this week. 
Uh, to assist in an effective transition, we have contracted with the Division of Professional Licensure, an agency of the Office of Consumer Affairs and Business Regulation, to perform the day-to-day -day activities that support the Massachusetts horse racing, paramutual wagering, and simulcasting for the remainder of this racing season. Uh, during this transitional period, the, M, uh, the MGC will develop the capacity to directly perform those activities. So as this year goes on, we will be evaluating and uh, making decisions on, on next year's racing season when we will have those responsibilities. Uh, Division of Professional Licensure, DPL, will be responsible for the hiring, personnel management, and administrative <coughs> decisions for the end of this season. Uh, MGC will be responsible for the adjudicatory functions previously performed by the State Racing Commission, policy decisions and approvals necessary for DPL to perform these activities. In order for this transition of authority to become effective on May 20th, we, in conjunction with our attorneys from the law firm <coughs> of Anderson Krieger, have taken the following steps. A drafted emergency regulations which outline the transfer of responsibilities. We will be entering into an interdepartmental service agreement with DPL to perform the operational duties I just mentioned. In addition, uh, at the request of Chairman Crosby, the Commission will be delegating all of the adjudica adjudicatory functions, policy recommendations, recommendations and approvals to me. I will be the Commissioner responsible for reporting back to the full Commission. Uh, on those activities. And to summarize those responsibilities um, during this transition period, I will be conducting <laughs> monthly adjudicatory hearings, after which I will prepare uh, written decisions to be presented to the full commission for approval. Uh, I'll be making policy and approval recommendations to the uh, commission with state racing, formerly state racing commission matters. The DPL staff attorney, uh, who is uh, Charles Kelb, who is currently, um, he serves as the legal counsel to the State Racing Commission. He will continue in his capacity uh, for the Massachusetts Gaming Commission with regard to racing matters. DPL Deputy Director Casey Atkins, who has direct oversight of all the State Racing Commission operations today, in fact, she's here today, and she's going to tell us a little bit about uh, the responsibilities that will remain with DPL. But before we ask uh, Director Atkins to come up here and, and talk to us about that, um, I wanted to explain that all of these transition components necessary to comply with the law will be specified in the form of four motions, uh, which Commissioner McHugh will present after uh, Director Atkins explains the responsibilities that DPL will continue to have during this transition period. Casey? Can I ask, come on yes. up, Casey, but can I ask you, uh, yeah. so the, 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 meeting, the me meetings that the Racing Commission used to have, the commission meetings that the Racing Commission used to have to hear license applications, uh, um, appeals. appeals of decisions, right, <coughs> Though, those will now be conducted by you alone? Yes, correct. And you decide or do you I, advi advise I, us and then we adapt? I will have decision recommendations for the full commission. Okay. I will write up my uh, thoughts and what I believe the decision will be, <clears throat> but the full commission will have uh, uh, approval authority. So any votes that would have been required by the State Racing Commission as a practical matter, are those votes still required now to be taken by the Mass Gaming Commission? Or have we somehow well, circumvented that? Well, we haven't circumvented. We have, um, we have put a system together where I will be the hearing officer. I will be listening to the facts. State police will be presenting facts. Uh, I will be uh, making a recommendation to the full commission that, we, uh, that a decision should go one way or the other. And there will be time for all of you to ask questions. We won't be rehearing the entire matter. We will be. Uh, I will be just uh, summarizing the hearing and my recommendations for approval. Okay. Great. Ms. Atkins. Hello, Commissioners. Thank you for having me here today. Um, as 
Commissioner Cameron mentioned uh, the Division of Professional Oversight will continue, I'm sorry, the Division of Professional Licensure will continue oversight <laughs> of daily operations, including management of personnel uh, who will remain DPL employees until December 31st, 2012. Um, in this regard, we will oversee daily track and laboratory operations, um, as well as administrative and financial operations, including human resources and basic administrative functions, as well as fiscal oversight. Additionally, uh, we will um, continue our oversight of enforcement and legal oversight in coordination with the Commission. Um, as Commissioner Cameron mentioned, our uh, counsel, Charles Kilb, will work with, uh, with the Gaming Commission on adjudicatory matters, provide advice and assistance. Um, further, we will um, we'll provide other assistance as the Gaming Commission needs for day-to-day uh, -day oversight of operations. So it asks sort of the same question, as a practical matter, at the operating level for the staff, the consultants, and the people in DPL, nothing changes? They remain DPL employees, and DPL will continue that day-to-day -day oversight. The statutory decision-making authority that was held by the SRC commissioners will now reside with the right. Gaming Commission. Right, but the day-to-day -day operations will pretty, this will be pretty much transparent to everybody involved. I mean, the, everything is just going to continue to operate same person, except for Commissioner Cameron and the consultant uh, who is going to be taking a look at things. Everything else will pretty much operate as it has in the past. Yes, that's correct. For the balance of this racing year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. I would just like to um, state that uh, personnel at the uh, Division of uh, Professional Licensure in and uh, Deputy Director Atkins in particular have been most helpful to us with this transition. Um, understanding that we're not fully staffed to take over all of those responsibilities at this time and not wanting to hire staff without a, a, a hiring plan that made sense, they, they have been um, most helpful in accommodating a plan which we think will serve the industry best. Uh, and the needs of the commission. So I just wanted to thank uh, Deputy Director Atkins. We're happy to help. And, and I know that Commissioner Cameron's going to be going around to all the facilities and meeting the people and saying hello on our behalf, but, but I've said this before, but both of you, Casey, I hope you'll say to the folks who have gone through this, you know, who have been for a year now not knowing whether they had jobs or not, knowing what they were going to be doing, and apparently have stuck with us, that, that we appreciate their sticking with us. I will extend that message. Any general questions for Director Atkins? I had uh, not so much a question, but uh, a thought. The um, Racing Commission's website is a very helpful resource for everybody who is um, interested in commission doings and regulations and rules. It's well designed, it's transparent, the information is there. So I would hope that as the transition occurs, we could uh, keep that website up, work with you to make uh, an appropriate cross-reference or cross-links so that people who are interested in, in uh, racing could um, go to our site, and, but then have your site as, as a place where, where we link to to, to continue that, that very useful information that's there. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And, and since starting the 20th, it will be we. So, you know, if Brandon, you know, very easy to put a big, bold SRC, I mean, uh, racing uh, business logo or something on our on our website that then would link directly to theirs. That's a really good idea. Thank you. Any other um, any other thoughts about this? Questions? Just to clarify, um, the the first ISA that uh, we we approved in motion a couple of weeks ago, I believe, um, has that now been uh, executed? Um, just for my, um, the, the, the one having to do with um, transfers of the, um, the, 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 the monies to, yeah, the uh, monies to, to the, um, the kennel, uh, kennel owners, owners yeah. dog owners, yes. Well, the ISA has been um, approved. 
Uh, final numbers were due in this week, because the monies all depend on numbers that come in. Those numbers were due this week, and we anticipate checks going out next week. Um, and the consultant, that's? Uh, yes, uh, we have, as we know, we, we voted last week right. to hire uh, uh, Ms. Allman, and we have had um, uh, strategy discussions with Deputy Director Atkins, and she will be uh, coming in later on this month to start her responsibilities. Okay, great. And Commissioner McHugh mentioned last week that the idea of having the group of us get mm -hmm. together, maybe take a day and go around to the various facilities sometime in the not too distant future would be really helpful. Yeah, I know the consultant will be in on the 23rd and 24th. Uh, that will be the opportunity that I'll have to go out to the tracks and, 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 and meet everybody and, and get a look at the operations firsthand. Uh, that would be an opportunity for other commissioners to join us or we can set a separate date. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I think you've got, a, you've got a job to do to meet them as, as their direct report in effect. But for us, it's more just kind of a general oversight to so maybe two different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. And mm -hmm. and right. And get sort of get presentations from them. Mm -hmm. However you want to do it, but okay. but I think it's a good idea. Are we ready to switch? Yes. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. We'll be seeing more of you. Um, Mr. McHugh, do you want to pick up on the... Uh, surely, Mr. Chairman, we have four uh, motions here that are necessary to do the technical um, and substantive transfer of um, uh, uh, responsibilities. The f I'm going to outline them and then we'll go through them seriatim because they're, they're um, because they're, they're to explain what they are. The first is a motion to promulgate emergency regulations. Emergency regulations um, really is a, a mechanism for um, promulgating regulations that will keep the existing regulations in place um, and allow us the time that we need to um, think about uh, the content of those regulations. If we want to keep them in place, so go through the regular process. Uh, but uh, in the interim, the existing order will remain unchanged. And so that's what that uh, motion is designed to do. Um, promulgating regulations takes a period of time. It takes a time for public comment. And all of that will follow. But this is uh, simply a bridge to keep the existing regulations in place now as we uh, examine what they say. So I'm going to move uh, in the following fashion uh, to do that. I move that the Gaming Commission promulgate emergency regulations effective May 20, 2012 <clears throat> to provide for the orderly transition of the regulation of horse racing, harness racing, uh, paramutual wagering, simulcasting, ca and uh, related subjects from the Massachusetts Racing Commission to the Massachusetts Gaming Commission in substantially the form uh, attached and to authorize the, the Commission's secretary to take all necessary actions, including without limitation the filing of emergency regulations with and making any edits and corrections as may be necessary to conform to the Gaming Act and the requirements of the Massachusetts Secretary of the Commonwealth for the proper promulgation of these regulations. Do I have a second? Second the motion. Discussion on the motion? It I'm sure this is just a technicality, but I didn't put that in the motion, Mr. Chairman. You, that so, was so dog racing. So you left we, it we out on purpose, right? I okay. Did. Okay. Good. I, I was wondering about that. We don't have dog racing, and so that is okay. not in the motion. Okay. Any further discussion on the motion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion passes unanimously. All right. Now the second motion that I have is a motion. Um, that is designed to give a public notice of what we've just done. We've passed the emergency regulations. The emergency regulations will be promulgated. This next motion is designed to uh, allow us to post a, a notice so that uh, in various places so that everybody will understand that this transition has occurred, the transition from the Racing Commission to us with the existing regulations still in place. The form of the notice is attached uh, to the work papers. It's been part of uh, what's been, what's, uh, 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 what the motion is talking about. And this is simply a motion that authorizes to post that 
document. So I'd move that the Gaming Commission issue a notice of public interest substantially in the form attached to, to, the, to the motion, explaining the background and reasons for the Commission's promulgation of emergency regulations effective May 20, 2012, concerning the former Massachusetts State Racing Commission, and to authorize the Commission's Secretary to take any actions he may deem appropriate to post or publish notice of the Commission uh, on the Commission's website in the Massachusetts Register of the Secretary of the Commonwealth or otherwise. Do I have a second? Second. So, any discussion on the motion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. All right, and we'll have that notice uh, published then in the appropriate places uh, <coughs> in the very near future. Uh, now, this next one is um, a motion that's designed to authorize Commissioner Cameron to complete uh, the, the, the uh, details, I should say, of the uh, inter-agency uh, service agreement that will uh, um, operate uh, between us and the uh, Department of Public Licensure uh, for the services that both Commissioner uh, Cameron and uh, Ms. Atkins just described. Uh, those uh, negotiations have been going on for some time. There's some detail that has to be uh, completed, but uh, that detail will be completed shortly. It's not completed at the moment. This authorizes Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Cameron uh, to complete that detail so that the agreement uh, will be in place uh, in timely fashion. So with that prologue and background, uh, I move that the Gaming Commission authorize and direct Commissioner Cameron to negotiate, finalize, execute, and enter into and then administer on behalf of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission an interdepartmental service agreement or agreements and any amendments thereto with the Division of Professional Licensure, an agency of the Office of Consumer Affairs and Business Regulation concerning matters formerly within the jurisdiction of the State Racing Commission and transferred to the jurisdiction of the Gaming Commission effective May 20, 2012, pursuant to which uh, the Department of Public Licensure will perform for a transitional periods or period, day-to-day -day activities with respect to horse racing, harness racing, paramutual wagering, simulcasting, and related matters, including, without limitation, matters pertaining to routine track, simulcasting, and laboratory operations, administrative, fiscal, and human resources operations, enforcement and public safety activities, and legal oversight and assistance with respect to adjudicatory proceedings. Second. Second. Any discussion on the motion? You okay with that, Commissioner? I am, Mr. Chair. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Now, the final motion is a contingent motion uh, to give uh, Commissioner Cameron some discretion in the event that uh, she uh, feels it appropriate to exercise that discretion. Uh, you heard her say that she will become the hearing officer, um, taking the place of the hearing officers who formerly uh, uh, performed uh, for the uh, Division of Public Licensure, the Racing Commission. Um, and there is a document that's not, re uh, with respect to which a vote is not required today, that you will sign authorizing her to do that. That's a, a matter within your discretion, Mr. Chairman. Um, but this, uh, most, this next motion is a motion that authorizes Commissioner Cameron uh, to consult with uh, the Division of Administrative Law Appeals to take over some of the hearing responsibilities if and to the extent she thinks it's appropriate to do so. It may be that as we get into this um, and get into the other activities uh, that we're involved in, uh, that the task of conducting the hearings and the reviews uh, is more time consuming than we think beneficial. It may not be. We, we simply don't know. Uh, but this would give, uh, this motion that I'm about to make would give Commissioner Cameron the opportunity, if it turns out that it is more time consuming uh, than we think uh, 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 we can afford it to be, uh, to go to the division and engage in negotiations with them to take over uh, these kinds of uh, hearings and appeals. They are the department of the state government that does this for a wide variety of uh, state agencies. They have the expertise. They have administrative law judges. They're very skilled in this. 
and they have a whole procedure designed to do it. They're administrative law judges. So that's the background for this next uh, motion that I'm about to make. And the motion itself is that um, uh, the Gaming Commission authorize Commissioner Cameron to negotiate, finalize, execute, and enter into and administer on behalf of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission any necessary requests to and interagency agreements or other arrangements with the Division of Administrative Law Appeals, pursuant to which that division will conduct adjudicatory hearings concerning certain classes of administrative appeals formerly within the jurisdiction of the Massachusetts State Racing Commission and effective on May 20, 2012, now within the jurisdiction of the Gaming Commission related to horse racing, harness horse racing, uh, paramutual wagering, simulcasting, and related matters. Second. Second. Any discussion on the motion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. No, nay. I mean, motion passes unanimously. Uh, one other item on this topic. Um, the legislation calls for the creation of a horse racing committee, I think it's called, uh, pursuant to the establishment of the stabilization fund and directs that either I be the uh, commission's representative or a designee and that we select that designee by May 20th, or I think it's May 20th. Um, so I'm thinking that you would be the natural person to be on that. And if you, have, I don't think we need a vote, but if you're okay with that, then I will notify the, 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 the chair, the governor's nominee is the chair of the horse racing committee. And um, so I assume the governor and that person will figure out when we're gonna get started, but I'll, I'll notify them to that effect. Okay, great. Yes. Great. Anything else about the horse racing business, racing commission? Thank you very much. Good stuff. Good work. You're welcome. Thank you, Director Atkins. <laughs> um, okay. We um, had anticipated talking quite a bit about the um, development of the work plan with the gaming consultant, but unfortunately at the last minute the representative of the gaming consultant couldn't come. Um, so we're going to have to postpone a good portion of that. I just wanted to clarify a couple things, and there may be some things we can talk about. Um, First of all, there's, there's the contract which we'll be signing, there's a statement of work which is referred to in the contract and which really is the guts of the contract. That is being negotiated now with the consultant team which is made up of both Spectrum and Michael and Carol. And then the, uh, this, and that also is signed by the parties and is, as I say, is the heart of the contract. And we're very close to having that completed. Commissioner Zuniga and I have been uh, negotiating that. We're very close to completion of that statement of work. The, st the statement of work refers to the work plan, which is the document that I did pass out, um, which you all, have, excuse me, you all have seen and have been thinking about. And this really represents the totality of the work that's going to be done by week by responsible party. Uh, during the course of the what will essentially be a 16-week project uh, by the gaming consultants. <clears throat> if, if there are questions here that you want to bring up that, that you can discuss dis constructively without the gaming consultant here, let's do it. But I think for the most part, we probably need to wait until next week when we can have them here. Um, but a, a second point is that, as Commissioner McHugh said, there is also a work plan that, that Anderson Krieger, the law firm, has worked out over a similar time period, not identical, but a similar time period. And what we would like to have on the wall in the commission is a project management chart, which will include all of the items on the gaming consultant's work chart, work plan, and all the intersecting items of the law firm and all the required actions on our point, like when we're supposed to set up funds, when we're supposed to, to um, uh, set up advisory committees and so on and so forth. So we will have a really comprehensive chart with dates and responsible parties for basically everything that we're doing. And that will be, a, that will be the guide to the next four to five months. Uh, and we're well towards that with the work that the two outside firms have already done. 
uh, and it'll this will be the backbone of it, but we'll be adding a lot onto it. So I think that's a really that's a great tool, and we've been longing for that for a long time um, to make sure we've got a, a reference point for everything that we're doing. So do you want to discuss this at all, or do you want to wait until um, the consultants are able to be here? I had a question that I think that it's a question for the commission as opposed to uh, the consultant. Uh, I'm looking at the last page under um, uh, the second to last category where it talks about hires. Um, and it, it, it talks about um, uh, the commissioner, the, uh, rec uh, review the recommendations with the commission. And it just seemed to me, and that, that goes, that's the entire work period that they want, they need to review those recommendations with the commission. And it, it, and it struck me that possibly we should have a commissioner and maybe a backup assigned to work with the consultants on each of these categories so that they know, we know we're going to be expected to, to work on that particular item um, with someone else possibly. It just, it just seems to me they can't meet with all of us all the time, and that quite the opposite. <laughs> you're right. So, so it just would seem to me that it may make some sense for us to go through and say, okay, you're going to be working on this, this item and that item, and so we'll know we'll be interfacing with the consultants on those tasks. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. In, in this in this column, um, it's it does say in many cases yes. it says MGC personnel, but, but yes. we could we could identify where we know that either the responsible commissioner Correct. or as we hire other people, we could put them on there. I think that's a good idea. Anything else? I, I had a couple of questions that uh, that are really for the gaming uh, consultants, but um, I, um, let me just mention a couple of things just for our consideration. Um, the, the, this 16-week uh, period that, uh, that starts, I guess, as soon as we get the contract signed, um, has a number of weeks in uh, particularly around June, uh, I see June and July, that are, uh, if, if, we, if we go across, that, down the whole plan, um, they, they make demands on resources, uh, on significant resources uh, in general, uh, only by virtue of there's activities, um, you know, there's a number of activities happening every week. Um, and, and this is not just, uh, uh, in addition to the point of Commissioner Cameron, how much or how, uh, of resources are, are going to be needed of commissioners individually or commissioners as a group or staff of the commission. But also, I'd like to understand um, the, the, the resources that consultants will bring um, relative to, um, you know, many of those activities. What, what assumptions are there? in terms of uh, resources. Um, again, this is, this, this is a general uh, way of, of saying that some of these uh, uh, weeks are going to be very, um, very busy. Um, and some of these may have some dependencies. Um, I'm talking about, for example, um, developing uh, the, the RFQ uh, process um, at the same time that we are writing regulations. And uh, clearly, regulations uh, have, um, have to stipulate the RFQ process uh, for which we are informing ourselves, uh, et cetera. So I'm not suggesting that one should be done before the other, but um, um, I, I, I need to be able to understand what dependencies are inherent right. to those uh, processes. Well, I think that's a really good point, and and I think, um, for my money at least, it would be worth making this a a real Gantt chart, you know, that does track interdependencies. It's a real right. critical path chart, because it, there's so much to be done, it's so much going on so fast um, that uh, to not have critical path connections identified here. And that will surface issues. There are a number of scheduling. I mean, this is a draft, so it's okay that there are some disconnects in this. But, um, and it's, it's, a, it's a big, big step towards what we need to get done. But a critical path chart will show us, will re reveal inconsistencies like you're talking about, where there are 
conditions precedent, which are in the wrong place in the chart. So I think, um, I think we'll we should ask one or the other, of whichever the consultants is best at putting together Microsoft project, um, to do that. I think that's a really good point. I mean, it's just, there's just, there are so many moving parts, parts and we're, we're going to need to add in the Racing Commission. The Racing Commission isn't right. even on this chart. And all of a sudden, we've got a whole host of steps to be taken there. So right. I think that's a really good suggestion. And I, you know, you and I can follow up with, um, mm -hmm. with the commission, with, with the, the consultants to do that. Yep. Um, another piece that I had also was, um, it occurs to me by reading the tasks that um, this work plan anticipates that public hearings to be done <clears throat> after, at the completion, or after uh, the completion of the work plan of the 16 or however many weeks it turns out uh, to be. And um, that's perfectly what's required of us. Uh, we, we first draft the regulations and then we issue them for public comment and then we can come back and revisit, uh, et cetera. But is there anywhere relative to um, obtaining advice, consulting with uh, stakeholders that could benefit the writing of those very um, regulations, for example, or, or, or the, the facilitation of this uh, work plan. Um, and, and, you know, this, this may be very ambitious, of course, because in order to do something of this magnitude in 16 weeks, the, the more people that <laughs> we attempt to bring in, uh, it, 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 uh, the more exponential the, the difficulty becomes. But um, are there any junctures any uh, milestones in between this work plan where we can either consult uh, with, with, um, with necessary um, groups. Um, I'm just extrapolating one of the few tasks here initially have to do with consulting with other jurisdictions. Um, and and that's, that's a great uh, process. But is there anywhere in the middle or anywhere at the end of some of these process that uh, we can either circle back or, or, or consult in more, in more detail. It's one thing to talk conceptually, uh, but another one to, yeah. to, to talk in more detail. And it's only, it's a rhetorical question, but it's a, yeah. a question for, for us, for this commission. But again, I think, it's a, I think it's a really good point. And there's another thing that will have to be added to this is the communications and outreach Right. plan, which we already have going on. It'll need right. to be layered into this. And one of the issues would be where are our stakeholders that need to be brought into this process. And it, you know, it, as you said, there's, a, there's, an, there's an exponential yep. impact. Yep. But I'd rather spread this out and do everything that we need to do rather than force it artificially into a 16-week period. So if it takes a little longer because we're doing it right, then that's OK. Mm -hmm. I guess that's the point I was uh, going to make, Mr. Uh, Chairman. I, I think this is essential to do, but it's, it's, we have to understand that this is plastic and uh, it's, it's going to change. And the whole nature of a Gantt chart and, and a critical path chart is to identify the kinds of things that you can't figure out otherwise. And this, this may spread itself out. We may find ways that, to contract certain things and we will identify uh, task to split up among us and, and, and uh, to move forward. But in any event, we'll have some way of keeping track of exactly where we are, where we need to move out, and uh, the kinds of adjustments we need to make going forward. So I think we need to, we definitely need to turn this into that kind of a chart yeah. and, uh, t and uh, organizational plan. I agree with the other comments. Just some clarification the next time we're talking to, uh, to our consultants is they've kind of outlined a, a, some work around the RFQ and the RFP process, and then they segment the RFQ planning process. So I didn't know if some of that was done in anticipation of us approving an RFQ process or whether it was just kind of folded in afterwards. But I think that's one of the, that's, those two that's one of the many together. things that needs to get clarified on this. I, I agree. I made that same observation. Uh, one, a couple of points as we've been negotiating the statement of work, which is what the work plan will fit into, um, we, have the, we have increased the scope here several times. We've asked them to help in advance of the contract actually being signed on the, def the description of an edit of a executive director. We asked them to expand on this idea of bifurcating the MOU from, or the uh, RFQ uh, from the RFP. 
We've asked for help on racing commission issues. We've asked for help on the tribal uh, compact issues, et cetera, um, all of which they've been perfectly willing to do, um, but it's going to put, I think it's going to drive the total. Plus, we've asked the two of them to work together, which creates, it's good for us because I get, we get the benefit of both teams, I think, but it does create some inefficiencies. Um, and I think now the, the we will probably max out on the amount. There was a cap of 500,000. Um, one of the bids was slightly under that, and one of the bids was uh, more than 100 grand under that. But I think we're going to end up being right up against the cap. But I think we've talked about that, and it's. I think we will do better. It's probably going to be a fixed price contract rather than an hourly rate, uh, and for the tasks as outlined in this scope of work and work plan. Um, and I think I think we'll be better off for that. But just FYI, that's what Commissioner Zuniga and I have been working on. Okay. Um, we will then pick up on that. I know we all, I at least, and several people have a lot of detailed questions about this, which are appropriate, but we'll put that off until next week. Um, Finance budget, do we have anything significant to talk about? Very minimal. Now that we are um, executing contracts with our lawyer, um, outside counsel, that is uh, our uh, inter-service agreements with DPL, uh, we'll start reflecting all of those numbers into the form of an encumbrance into our Mars system right. so that that becomes incorporated into the finance report. Um, the other one, uh, I, I already gave the update relative to the procurement um, right. uh, of the executive search firm. Great. Okay, uh, number seven, public education information. Uh, the Economic Development Forum. Just want to give us a quick status report? Sure. Uh, again, the date is June 14th. I visited Clint Sigamon Community College last week and, and met with their folks as well as the president of the college who's happy to host us. Uh, we are finalizing some ad additional speakers. It's involved me talking to them and kind of figuring out where they're trying to pick their line of work that we really want them to focus on. Obviously, uh, some of the folks whose names we picked up, Professor Barrow had sent us a list of recommendations, following up with them and trying to make sure that we're not having a lot of duplication from our panelists, but hopefully covering topic areas which are going to be reflective and, and, and helpful in the, in the Commission's work. So uh, my goal is to, uh, to finalize the speakers this week, work with MMA to help distribute information about the event, uh, and work with Janice on, on some of the logistical details. But we have most, most of the bodies all confirmed. It's a matter of getting people to address certain is issues so we don't have just a lot of people repeating the same information right, over good. and over again. Okay. Great. Um, and on what it, we're now trying to hone in on either June 4th or June 8th, if we can do it, for the what will become the second, not the third, but the, the other forum, which was on community mitigation and compulsive gambling. Um, the, the, the moderators are set. It's Kathy um, Scanlon for compulsive gambling and Mark Drazen from MAPC for uh, the community mitigation. And we are now working on the panelists for that group and the format. Again, I think it's going to be probably about a half day, maybe no more than four hours. Um, and uh, MAPC is going to help with the logistics. And I'm actually talking to them later today if we get back in time to try to work out those. And we're we're going to try to do it the week of the 4th. That may be too fast. If we can't, we'll slip it. Um, but um, for reasons of vacations and everything, it would be nice to get it done if we could um, for the, the 14th one. Mr. Chair, yep. can I mention just sure. um, this dovetails into the previous update. I will be putting together an, uh, um, a budget, uh, uh, you know, small budget relative to the public forum. Uh, I will consult with Commissioner St Stebbins relative to what items, if any, um, have, have a cost associated with it. Um, you know, for, for consideration. Great. Uh, request for information. Uh, there are two items, Mr. Chairman, that I wanted to uh, discuss with the Commission today. 
We talked last week about, or yes, last week, about the fact that we are getting a variety of questions uh, from members of the public on our webs via our website, and uh, have uh, uh, a mechanism for answering them. Most of them can be answered uh, fairly quickly and without much uh, much uh, discussion. But from time to time, there are questions that that uh, are really worth discussing as a group before we give an answer, so that we're all on the same page with respect to them. Uh, Commissioner Stebbins and I have been talking about some of these uh, questions, and there are two today that I thought it would be helpful to take a look at because they're representative of representatives of other questions, and uh, in one form or another, we can expect them to recur as we move forward. So uh, the first of those. Um, is uh, this. Uh, we have a, a question from an individual who says uh, that his company is interested in developing a poker room in Massachusetts where live face-to-face -face poker games would be played between patrons with house earnings, a, a percentage fee, or a rake uh, from each pot. Uh, no traditional casino games or slots would be offered. Uh, this person says, I'd like to know if current, current gaming regulations would allow for the operation of such a venue, and if so, what the licensing requirements are. There are no uh, current gaming regulations, and so that's obvious. But the question raised for me, and I put it to the Commission, a, a slightly broader question, and that is the extent to which the Commission should be in the business of responding to what amounts to requests for legal advice uh, by individuals who have a particular kind of activity they'd like to undertake. There's a fine uh, line, and, and in many cases not so fine a line, but there's a, a line between giving general advice to uh, people uh, either through uh, answers to particular questions or developing policies or regulations that address general prop, uh, problems and questions and issues. And um, uh, having uh, answers come in after a, a hearings that we conduct and then just giving advice to people who have a specific question about a specific activity they want to engage in and the specific legality of that question. And with respect to those questions, uh, I would recommend that we take the position that, that uh, we don't do that, that they need to consult their own counsel and make their own judgments uh, about what the statute uh, permits uh, and doesn't permit, and that as regulations are promulgated, the, that they consult with counsel uh, of their own choosing as to the interpretation of the regulations rather than trying to um, give answers to these kinds of questions when we don't know the facts and really aren't in a position to, to give that kind of advice. So I put that out for discussion as to whether as we go forward with these kinds of questions, and it's a judgment call as to whether this question is general or particular, but within that general framework that we uh, adopt the position that we're, we're just not going to give those kinds of particularized answers to those questions. But I welcome the discussion on that. Well, I, I certainly agree with you that um, we could go down a road that, um, you know, we would have one person answering a question one way, and I think that that is not a, a good place for us to be, and, and that certainly is a legal matter. And uh, that makes a lot of sense to me that we proceed as you outlined. Would you be saying the same thing if we were now in steady state operations and we had a legal staff and we had gaming regulations in place and so forth? That, I, I, I don't know that I would. Uh, but but uh, uh, I think that giving legal ad what amounts to legal advice to an individual about what his or her business operations can consist of is going to remain a tricky business throughout, even if we were in a steady state. And we have to be very careful about developing regulations um, that uh, deal with that so that we're not in the position of interpreting a regulation to permit something that some other law enforcement agency may think is, is not appropriate. There's a way to deal with that. And I, th I, I, I think we have to be very careful of that, even if we were in a steady state operation. But we're not in a steady state operation. And for now, I think we just can't uh, answer those kinds of particularized questions. What about recommending that the person or such questions go to whoever we can identify as the right person in the AG's office to ask? 
Well, I'm not sure the AG's office is in a position to be answering these kinds of questions either. In fact, I'm pretty confident that the AG's office would not answer these questions. I, I think advisory opinions ab about abstractions uh, 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 are things that people uh, who are uh, in a steady state operation are just not going to answer. These are, these are legal issues that lawyers have to figure out, make some advice, and, and it's, it's not something that one can give an off-the-cuff answer to. So, I, how, so how does that person figure out what to do? That person goes to a lawyer, the same way uh, people who are operating a business, uh, if they can't figure out, uh, go to a business planning person, uh, a lawyer who, who represents them, gives that person their best legal advice and judgment, and uh, that person acts uh, the way any other business person would on the advice counsel give them. Maybe, I don't know, I'm not, I'm, it's not that big a deal, but it just, it feels a little, um, a little bureaucratic, you know, there's, maybe it's bureaucratic for a good reason, but it feels to me like this guy's just trying to figure out whether he can have a poker game in his house, or whatever the question is, and, and to not be able to find somebody to ask, go ask, have to spend a bunch of money to hire a lawyer, it feels I, like. In this particular case, it seems to me the answer is pretty clear, uh, but, but as a policy, it seems, and I raise it as a policy. Yeah, right. Uh, it seems to me that that going forward with these kinds of particularized questions, we are doing nobody a service, and uh, including the public, uh, by answering those kinds of questions. Uh, it's the same thing. It seems to me if a, uh, a business person uh, wants to get uh, somebody uh, on the telephone to opine as to compliance with some food and drug regulation. And they're just not going to get that kind of answer from anybody. And, and that's, that one can argue that that's a difficulty of doing business in a complex society. And, and, and I would sympathize with that to a certain extent. On the other hand, these regulations are, and, and laws and, uh, are complex. And uh, to give answers in the abstract may be entirely misleading. When when you don't know all the facts. Well, I, I totally don't think we should we should give a legal opinion on this, and we're not we're definitely not up to doing. That's why I asked the question: Would you feel right. the same way if we were in steady state? So right. I, as a matter of policy, we should, we can't answer questions like that. I agree, but trying to figure out a place to send such people, if there were, you know, if there's the in in economic development, they have people there. They have on ombudsmen who are trying right. to help people start right. businesses and right. stuff. There must be somebody out there that we could suggest they at least try to get well it, it, as we go forward and get ourselves up to a steady state operation it seems to me we could develop a process for having an ombudsman for having a mechanism for getting these kinds of opinions that was non-bureaucratic to the extent we could make it that was simple that was straightforward and uh, when that moment arrives, uh, as we're thinking through these regulations, it's certainly a topic worth consideration. But I think still at the end, uh, to try and give people what amounts to business planning advice uh, is not going to be something we can uh, profitably uh, spend our time on. Yeah. I mean, there, there, there are free business, small business startup resources available around the Commonwealth of the Small Business Development Centers. I, I don't know whether they would be able to particularly address the legality of a business, but certainly other business ideas come and go in front of them and they can say that's not allowed or that is allowed. Or, you know, I, I think as we've seen with some businesses, including some that the AG is trying to shut down, you have businesses that pop up whose grounds or operations are then found to be illegal. Um, but, uh, you know, I think your point, Mr. Chairman, about would our answer today be the same answer we would give maybe five or six years from now when we're up and going? I think would be a different question. Yeah. But you know, considering everything we're charged and tasked with, trying to deviate down a path of somebody who wants to take us in a business direction to say promulgate regs for me or tell me if I'm legally allowed to do this, I think is kind of a stretch beyond our responsibilities at this point. I agree with that. I think it's just a matter of how we do it. You know, I mean, I think trying trying to be perceived as a as a responsive agency if we say 
we, we don't have the ability to do that. There may be people in the such and such office of this agency or that agency, or there may be people in the, at the, your local chamber of, we're trying to do something if we can. Just We, we want to feel like we're trying to give people the best we can give them, not just stiff arm them, that's all. It's just a matter of the way it's done. I, I don't disagree with the substance of the point, but I think the manner, I do think the manner is important. There's nothing worse than getting a, a bureaucratic sounding letter saying, I can't help you, you know, that's right. just annoying. Right. So. Well, I would concur with the idea that um, as a matter of general policy and principle, uh, we should um, be away from providing business or even or legal, certainly legal, uh, but even business advi advice. Um, I think uh, if we get specific questions about our own regulations, that's that's clearly something that we should have to be. Um, in the business of clarifying whenever that's that's very relevant. But um, in the absence of regulations where there is, um, where, where we start treading into the arena of a legal opinion, I would be uh, concurring 100% uh, with Mr. Commissioner McHugh relative to uh, really staying away from, um, from that notion. Well, certainly the idea here is not to stiff arm anybody. Uh, and uh, to the extent that there is a likely available alternative source for the answer, I think we should uh, point people in that direction. Uh, if if, uh, if uh, there isn't any uh, person on the horizon other than privately retained counsel, it seems to me we ought to at least tell the person that that's where we think the answer must lie. And, and the question may also be one of resources. Uh, um, if, if it's bogging down very scarce resources um, of this commission uh, uh, at the beginning where resources should really be applied to the main business of the commission, that's, that's a different question. Yeah. I don't think we have any, sub, any sub substantive. Just, you know, you can be told no nicely and you can be told no offensively. And we just want to, and I, I know you don't disagree with this. You know, no, no, I'm trying, trying to think believe about nice no's are important. Right, so okay. that's all I'm trying to say. <laughs> All right. Uh, Let's vote on being nice or not. No, I think we can do. We can oh, probably do that by acclamation. Right. Can't right. sense of the meaning. Right. right. Um, uh, the second one, I'm just going to generalize, and it has to do with um, uh, uh, a question from an individual who says, "Who uh, is responsible for?" Uh, uh, ensuring that public uh, officials in the city or town where this person lives uh, negotiate with uh, potential casino developers. How do I get uh, uh, the, the, uh, the public officials motivated to do it if they're not willing to do it? How do I get them uh, interested in voting? Who can negotiate a host agreement? And uh, uh, does the um, does the, uh, do the people as a whole have the uh, right to vote on whether negotiations uh, should uh, commence if the local officials are not willing to, um, if the local officials are not willing to uh, engage in negotiations? And there it seems to me that, that uh, the legislation is quite clear that, that uh, no class one or two license can issue without a community host agreement. Um, but, um, uh, and unless there's been a vote uh, to accept the, the uh, agreement. But, uh, and before there's an agreement, uh, before there's a vote, there has to be the, the agreement, as I say. But the statute doesn't uh, specify the process um, uh, for uh, uh, the negotiation of the agreement. And therefore, uh, it seems to me that uh, the commission's position ought to be in, uh, that the um, local municipal governmental organization and regulations determine who it is that um, uh, makes the decision with respect to engaging or not engaging in negotiations. And that's something in which the commission really doesn't have a role until uh, the, uh, the, uh, um, until the negotiations have concluded and the vote's been taken. So we're going to see those questions, I think, in a variety of slightly different forms as we go forward dealing with slightly different kinds of governmental entities and jurisdictional um, jurisdictional uh, areas. And that basically the commission is not in a position to um, uh, determine how 
those local judgments are made. So I throw that open for discussion as well. It's actually not even, it's not, in some cases, nobody knows really, right? I mean, it's, it's not really clear who, or maybe it is clear, who in, uh, in a surrounding community or a host community, a town or a city, um, is it clear who, who has to create the agreement which is then voted on? Well, the, the, the gaming legislation is silent. Okay? Right. Right? So you, you start with the proposition that the gaming legislation doesn't tell you anything about that um, and doesn't give the commission, with very limited exceptions, there is a limited exception for negotiations between a uh, developer and uh, a surrounding community after there's a host <coughs> agreement where the commission does have a does have a role. But apart from those limited exceptions, there's nothing in the gaming legislation that gives the commission a role in that. So what one's left with is the normal rules, regulations, laws, charters, and the like mm -hmm. that govern municipal operations. Right. And we are not in the business of interpreting what those regulations, charters, and other things say. That's something that's got to be resolved either in the, in the town itself or the city itself uh, or in some other fashion, but not uh, by us uh, making some kind of an edict or determination. Right. And, and that, it seems to me, is something we need to recognize and help that cities and towns understand and recognize that right. this is not a place where, where we're authorized to make interpretive judgments in that regard. And this is clearly a place where we can say, in the response, we can say yeah. this is not our, this is not our authority, um, but your town council or right. your, you right. know, whatever, right. um, is the place to turn for a question like right. this. Right. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, this does raise, though, the question we've talked about several times before about the um, extent to which we want to either provide or assure that it is provided support to potential host and surrounding communities for dealing with this issue. And we've, we've had slight differences of opinion on degrees of emphasis and how we should handle that, but I think we ended up talking about um, trying to make sure that somebody else can really step up to the plate and do this so that we're not in the middle of potentially giving out mixed messages to different communities and end up some possible accusations of favoritism or whatever, which I think makes sense. Where are we on that? And that, that's a ball I'd like not to lose track of. Is well, we, we've, you know, some of the other questions that have been posed to us have been around uh, funding fees for hiring a consultant to act on a municipality's behalf to negotiate a host agreement. Um, you know, some municipalities, from what you read in the media, are already posting RFPs for that type of assistance and help. Um, Commissioner Mukiu and I talked yesterday about, you know, there's some responsibilities in the legislation which gives us some authority to direct regulations, as well as, you know, how that might conflict with or, or, or work alongside uh, existing state regulations which allow somebody to accept money on behalf of a community. Um, so, um, you know, the question becomes, you know, uh, you know, on a host community agreement, should there be kind of a framework that we can help communities establish? I don't know. You know, what would we look for? Do we still leave that really all uh, within the authority of the of the local municipalities? I think that's we continue to wrestle. I mean, in, we've always talked about the initial assistance, support, trying to answer questions, whether those be deferred until we have regulations in place, uh, in, in trying to be as, as helpful and, uh, uh, and, and thorough and diligent as possible to assist the communities and give them at least some sense of where we're going or what direction they may want to take or, or what provisions of the law to look at. Um, uh, but in terms, I think we're still Beyond that, I think we're still trying to figure out where we can have a, a, a helpful uh, a helpful role in the process and what type of assistance we can offer. Certainly, there's going to be a level of assistance, you know, at some point when, with talking with surrounding communities. Uh, it was helpful to see in, in the draft work plan of getting some assistance to really help define what is 
an impacted surrounding community, which I think is uh, kind of leaves it wide open. But you know, beginning to focus in on that definition, and give some some uh, some context to it. I think is going to be helpful. Uh, uh, just to follow up on on what Commissioner Stebbins said, uh, the the the, the um, uh, both Section Four and Section Fifteen of the statute talk about compensating. Uh, 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 Communities for the work that's necessary to investigate the the, uh, the plan that uh, proposed developers coming forward with. It's a little ambiguity as to whether as to when that money is available. But that's an area, like many others in this statute, where I think that regulations can clarify ambiguity and be very helpful. And where we can develop a policy, put it into a regulation, and get it out there. And it seems, therefore, that one promising avenue in that regard would be to think early on about regulations that would um, allow us to define these kinds of ambiguous terms and set some conditions and procedures to help people and to have a development of regulations sequenced by the time and the process when people are going to need them. Uh, so that's one avenue uh, that I think we can proceed to give to cities and towns some help and, and again to uh, think about cooperation with the Mass Municipal Association and other like groups uh, to provide that, that kind of information and, and perhaps support it in some way. So it seems to me those two, as we talked about, uh, those two areas may well be, may well be promising areas to, to pursue. Well, I, I, I was reminded of the work plan, uh, some of the feedback relative to regulations, and, and there was also initial uh, d discussion a little while ago about emergency regulations. Is this one, this, it occurs to me that this would be one topic that clearly fits emergency regulations because a lot of activities follow the negotiations uh, of, of a host community, uh, host agreement, host community agreement rather. Um, so it, it, it's, a, it's an early item. Yeah. Well, I think that's a, I think your idea coupled with the emergency is a really good idea. Where, where, where there are significant issues relative to host and surrounding communities that are relevant to them immediately but are not clear, we could definitely jump on that. But even more than that, it feels to me like it, it would be what, in, a, in a, the normal course of events would be to say, okay, we're about to go off onto this huge new thing. We're about to bring in this new phenomenon, which is gonna have an enormous impact on a great many cities and towns and it would for somebody to proactively communicate with communities that might be host or surrounding and say we understand this big tsunami is coming down the road towards you right. um, and we have the ability to help uh, is something that would be some in the normal course of events if and I, I understand and I'm We'll certainly go along with and I'm not totally persuaded by Commissioner McHugh's point that it should not be we who play that role you know if, if that's the consensus I'm okay with that but I do think somebody should be playing that role and, and I think people are bereft a lot of people are bereft we get these wistful notes sometimes from people who don't know you know whether they're coming or going and um, it just seems to me it would, it's it's an appropriate role for the Commission to make sure that somebody whether it's MMA or the Collins Center or the, the RPAs is proactively communicating and saying we are here to help and we do have the resources to help and they can feed back to us if they if they identify problems that, that need regulatory explanation or expansion then that would be great it would be another source of feedback for us on things we need to do but it, it, it feels to me like we should push as a priority to get some kind of proactive outreach out there. I, I don't disagree with that, and I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not in the uh, against tsunami prevention. Um, uh, but but my, my point was that, 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 and there's a difference between answering particular, um, again, it gets back to the, sort of the same theme we talked about right. before, right. Yeah. answering particular issues about particular negotiations with particular people that we may later have to pass judgment on, and making general um, uh, statements and, and doing general things to help everybody understand the path through this. And I think, with respect to the latter, we ought to be doing as much of that as we can. 
and your idea uh, that you just articulated about having um, others act more directly on particular problems, feed them back to us, and then if we get a number of issues along the same lines, adopting, changing, passing regulations to help everybody understand right. what to do in this situation is exactly what we ought to be doing. So I think there's a way to do that, and I think we ought to be proactive about doing it. So we okay. don't have a disagreement on the general theme. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's right. Um, so maybe we should just pick, I know you had some sort of starting conversations, and you know we're we're not exactly clear on where we want to go here, but I think yeah. it's clearing up a little bit, and I think we ought to pick those balls back up again and, and see if we can find somebody who would play our, that our, role, our, distanced our, from us, but play that role perhaps with resources provided by us. Our, our conversations with Collins Institute was very early on. I think right now that we've had, we've hopefully addressed the racing commission piece and moved that aside. You know, right. You know, getting circling back with them to talk about our thoughts. Right on the RFQ process and other steps, I think it would be helpful. One, one, one thing I cannot help but wonder, um, throughout Massachusetts, uh, there's great diversity in the level of staff, just to name one, that cities and towns have. Um, you know, on the one hand, there's cities with large public works departments, financial uh, departments, um, budget capital, uh, programs, etc., and there's also towns where, you know, one or two people work, you know, in many of those um, roles. And uh, by way of saying that the financial and technical assistance could conceivably be very different, needed the need rather. Uh, and 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 a question for 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 this commission as we contemplate what that may be. We uh, need to be sensitive that different um, different towns and cities right. have uh, different needs. Um, by the same token, um, I completely agree that the help needs to be generalized. It needs to be uh, the, the more that we delve into specifics, the riskier uh, that the uniformity of the help gets. So yeah. uh, we should just be sensitive to all that. All right. Okay, I think we I think we have a good sense of how to move forward here. Um, anything else? That's it under that category. Under that category, um, I only had one thing under the item eight, other business, uh, which was Commissioner uh, Zuniga. You may want to um, we just give an update on the task force meeting, the uh, oh, online sure. task. It's really pr pretty interesting stuff going on there. Yep, the um, treasurer's office. Uh, um, conducted um, one of its meetings of the online products task force. This, uh, this is a task force that, uh, that is advisory in nature uh, to the treasurer uh, uh, as it pertains to um, lottery online, lottery type online products uh, that uh, are out there, uh, are, are developing in Europe, uh, Canada, et cetera. There's other, uh, there's different, it's, it's a very diverse group of people, and we now have uh, myself as a member of that task force. Um, Chairman Crosby came to give some um, very good remarks relative to the, the large uh, mission really here is um, one of uh, a benefit to the public good of the Commonwealth, not one of uh, turf battle as to whether anything should rely with a gaming commission or with a lottery commission. Um, but as we uh, look at the possibility of online uh, products um, um, coming to the states, Massachusetts, we'll have to see, that's a, that's a, a discretion of the legislature. Um, but this, this task force is really thinking uh, strategically as to what steps might need to be in place or what recommendations would have to be in place for the legislature if if we ever came to that you know those 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 uh, events uh, over there um, the general there was a good report from from spectrum uh, relative to what's happening in other jurisdictions there is a general consensus that uh, there's not one jurisdiction that applies uh, well here because this is in many ways on chartered territories for, for 
for the states, for, for jurisdictions like, um, like us and the Lottery Commission here. But, um, but there's also uh, a notion that these may not, the introduction of online products may not necessarily cannibalize either casinos or the lottery. Uh, that done uh, thoughtfully, um, it could enhance uh, the two the two operations. But I will I will continue to provide um, uh, updates as we continue to meet in those task forces. I have a question: Was there any discussion with the task force about ro what role the federal government will play in regulation? Yeah, well, these these all really came about to a great degree because um, the Justice Department um, issued an opinion to, I believe, New Jersey uh, relative to um, establishing and regulating these, these kinds of products. Um, I, I'm not going to be able to do it justice, but um, the, the gist of the opinion is that as long as it doesn't violate the Internet Gaming Act, and uh, this is a misnomer because that's, that's, that's not the real name. Um, the recent um, act in which federally um, uh, fly-by-night operations were prohibited from conducting any kind of gaming activity. That left open the door to lottery and gaming commissions to do that. Uh, the opinion was, um, you know, no business can set up to conduct that kind of operation, only jurisdictions like, like us and the lottery. And the other component was that uh, as long as it didn't um, violate the Wire Act, um, in other words, determined. sports betting, um, you know, that was a another piece, again, that we, this, this task force is not contemplating. Um, but the general opinion after that of the Department of Justice is that it defers to the states, uh, meaning in this case the state legislature uh, and how much appetite would be there to, to allow this is, is, a, is a big question. Here in Massachusetts, for example, that's a question for the leadership and, and, the, and the state reps and senators, um, and eventually, of course, the governor who would have to uh, sign something into law. But um, this recent opinion opens the door to a kind of first mover advantage as well, which is why the state treasurer's office is wanting to explore these sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. It's it's um, it, it's not a very big deal at the moment, but it could for us, but it could become very quickly. And other people raised the issue of whether we would be able to successfully negotiate with casinos if they don't know whether there's going to be some kind of internet gambling available sometime soon, possibly even before they're up and running. You know, and, and um, I mean, so it's, it's going to be a significant issue for us, and this, fortunately there are other people that are concerned about it. And of course the lottery is extremely concerned about whether this, as Commissioner said, you know, whether this will enhance lottery operations or detract from lottery operations. The trouble is, as again, as you said, there's, there's no place, there's no test case out there. There's no other jurisdiction to look at it and say, what happens when you bring in online gaming? What happens to pre-existing casinos, casinos, or what happens to pre-existing lotteries? Because in Europe, there are very different kinds of structures, um, and particularly because in Massachusetts, we have so high per capita lottery that nobody, you know, we have two and a half times the national average, almost three times the national average, and nobody knows what would happen in an environment like ours. Is it saturated? Anyway, so it's a really, but to, to the treasurer's credit, he put, A, he put people on this task force who are very independent thinkers, and all points of view are represented. A lot of people from the, several people from the public, from the private sector who are smart, tough-minded thinkers about this, and B, he quick, he completely agreed with the point that we made about we have to look at this holistically from the standpoint of the, the what's in the interest of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, not what's in the interest of the Gaming Commission or the Lottery. And I, everybody bought into that, I think, in a significant way, uh, which will, I mean, the devil's in the details, but for as a as a mindset for the organization for this task force, 
there was a, I think, a pretty thorough buy-in to that point, which was, which was good. There's also one more, uh, one just general or, or, or uh, observation uh, that came, came through yesterday. Uh, online, in general, online products, just like everywhere else, um, is attracting, uh, everything online, rather, is attracting a younger demographic. Right. Uh, whereas, in particular, for the lottery, which is a very mature operation and very successful, um, it's an aging demographic. So from a strategic perspective, um, there's, 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 there's something to consider there. Um, and then, of course, there's a very nascent gaming commission to be part of the mix uh, as it pertains, pertains to us. So these are very, very important sort of strategic considerations. Very, very really. I mean, I'm looking forward to keeping up to date on this. Yep. Okay, any other things that weren't anticipated? The topics? Anything else? No, none for me. All right. Motion to adjourn? So moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Motion passes. Awesome.